very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Nandini Sadasivam. I'm one of the haematology consultants at Manchester Royal. Um, so yeah, so today's talk is one of the series that uh, we are hoping as a network to do as a one hour short teaching sessions. And um, I'm going to be talking about um, monitoring for iron um, overload and a bit about iron collation. It's quite a lot of a lot of things to talk. So I've broke it down to as part one only to just cover uh, bits of it so that we don't have to rush through and we can do another session if you found it helpful. So I'm going to do a talk and I think we can do questions at the end, but if you've got any dying or urgent questions you want to ask, you just unmute and interrupt if you want to. So um, so one of the things that I thought we'll do it as, as a learning objective, the three objectives I hope you learn out of this session. The first one is familiarizing with the latest BSH guidance on frequency of monitoring for iron overload. The second one is recognizing the importance of calculating rate of iron loading in adjusting and optimizing um, your iron collation. And number three, this is really a case that um, I'll be sharing and is recognizing symptoms and urgencies of fatal complications of iron overload and initiating early treatment. So why is it quite important that we diagnose iron overload? It causes a lot of morbidity and is responsible uh, for um, the mortality that we see, especially in thalassemia syndromes and those with um, transfusion dependent um, uh, iron um, patients. The ferritin is not the most re reliable test, so you need confirmatory tests uh, so that we know what we're prescribing your iron collation for. Um, patients who are on intermittent transfusion, ad hoc transfusion, regular top pops, and even red cell exchanges, and those who are not transfusion dependent, so your NTDTs and some of the rarer inherited anemias, they can all iron overload over different times. But the ones who are at our highest risk and the ones we really hope the monitoring and effective monitoring will pick up and for, for across everybody, but definitely the ones at higher risk are those who are on regular top ups, who you know do not take collation regularly and compliance is not brilliant. These are the highest risk patients to get complications from iron overload. And you have to remember early iron overload is completely asymptomatic, which is why if we don't have monitoring, if the clinical nurse specialist, you don't have a robust team or engine of people who are doing these checks, clinicians won't know, the teams won't know, patients come for transfusion, do not take collation, and they can be iron loaded with very little signs there's something going terribly wrong and they're getting some side effects here. So the monitoring is really the key and the cornerstone uh, in ensuring you prevent any um, organ damage. So this is a slide that I think is really useful if you understand the mechanism and the distribution of iron and why we do this monitoring. It really helps um, uh, the nurses and junior doctors uh, and clinicians who are new into red cells into why the monitoring really means uh, is, is, the, is the key here. So this is a slide, um, it's actually I think John Porter's slide, uh, looking at transfusion iron overload specifically on transfusion dependent patients but it actually also applies for a lot of other patients um, who have regular transfusion. So the um, the, the the red uh, circle on the on the far right to me is your transfusion. So a patient comes in every three weeks uh, for two units of transfusion. Each unit of red cell has about 200 um, milligram of iron. So they're getting about 400 milligram of iron or even more every three weeks for the rest of their life. You and I only need about three to five milligram of iron. So what happens to this extra iron that comes in through transfusion? Your main site, what happens is main site of iron storage sits with the macrophage system. And what is this macrophage system? This is your liver, your bone marrow and your spleen. So you get blood coming in, the, ex the extra iron gets, gets um, metabolized and goes and sits in the liver, spleen and bone marrow. So if you think about it, one of the ways we measure for iron overload is looking at your liver iron concentration via your MRI liver scans. So we know that your liver iron concentration reflects your total body iron, 
So if your liver iron, your ferry scans are high, you've got a lot of iron. And if your ferry scan is low, you can be quite confident that you haven't got very much iron. And this is really because in the way the iron is, is sitting um, in, 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 and distributed in the body. So once your macrophage system is absolutely full, saturated, you get a spillover of, of, of iron circulating in your bloodstream in bound to your transferring. Once your transferring becomes saturated and that's full and can't take any more, you've got this excess iron that is not bound to anything and it's a complete unregulated free flow. It can do anything it wants to do. And this is what we call as the NTBI or non-transferring bound iron or your plasma labile iron. This is a term that you find coming back time and again when you read papers or people talk about it. But basically, these are irons that are not meant to be there. And it's these irons that go and get deposited in your extra hepatic organ, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, heart, your endocrine organs. They cause a lot of damage to the organs, the cell damage or this, these free radicals cause a lot of cell damage and cause irreversible organ dysfunction, which you hope through your monitoring, you will pick them up. So if you think about it, um, if you've had some liver iron loading over years and you've managed to de-iron the patient, the scarring um, increases the risk of getting fibrosis and liver cancer or liver cirrhosis 20 years down the road, even if the patient is iron neutral at that point in time. Patients will report palpitations if they've had previous myocardial iron deposition, even though at this point in time they may be iron neutral. And that's because of the scar tissue that might be there in the heart that causes some of these issues. They are benign, but they're a nuisance. You should investigate them. Iron in the pituitary glands gets deposited very, very early on. So unless you do pubertal checks from the age of 10, which is what the guidelines suggest, you're not going to pick up patients who do not go through puberty naturally. And you won't know unless you're monitoring for these gonadal functions. So the morbidities associated with iron overload, these are actually non-fatal. Iron in your endocrine organs are really non-fatal but they cause a lot of long-term morbidities to patients, and it really, really does impact on their quality of life. Um, like we've talked about, it's anterior pituitary gland hypogonadism, causing growth and development failure, delayed sexual development and infertility, diabetes, hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, and osteoporosis. It's a lot, a lot of endocrine dysfunction, and it really impacts on the quality of life and effective monitoring and intensification of chelation, you'd hope be able to prevent some of these. Now, the, we tend to react a bit more quickly to some of the fatal complications from iron overload. And this is um, what you see when you have iron in the heart and patients develop heart failures, or they have arrhythmias when you have some iron in the heart, but it's not at a level of T2 star of less than 10. Um, infections. Klebsiella is one of the leading causes of death these days, though I have to say in the north, I think um, myocardial iron is still a bit of a problem uh, that we need to address. Um, prolonged iron in the liver over years can cause scarring to your liver um, and increase your risk of liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And therefore, the monitoring actually continues indefinitely, even if the patient is iron neutral. Um, at the age of 40, but if they've had 20 years of iron prior to that, that risk is there ongoing. And this is something patients don't appreciate and they don't always know. Um, so before we go on to the next slides, which we look at the um, BCSH guidelines on the monitoring, it's worth looking at the reference values for the monitoring of iron. So one of the things we know, there are three things that we use to monitor that we all do quite regularly to look at um, iron overload that we do routinely in our clinical practice is we use the ferritin, but we also use tissue um, uh, iron uh, measurements, and that's your liver iron concentration and the cardiac T2 star. So these are sort of objective assessments of your iron overload, and we adjust our calculations based on this. 
So looking at the cardiac T2 star values, um, this is really the interest of those who may not be uh, very familiar. So if, if there are two things that I look for when I, uh, when I request a cardiac T2 MRI, that is what is the absolute value and what's the ejection fraction. So if the T2 star is more than 20 milliseconds, you haven't got iron in the heart. If you've got a T2 star that's less than 20, but more than eight, you've got mild to moderate. It's a bit of a worry. You've got risk of arrhythmias and you've got a risk of heart failure. If you've got a T2 star of less than eight milliseconds, you've got severe myocardial iron overload and you've got an increased risk of heart failure. I will also say at any point, if you've got low ejection fraction, regardless of what your value of T2 star is, it's a real cause for concern. You must intervene and act on that result. What about your liver iron MRI um, values? So if your liver iron concentration, the one, you know, the gold standard is Feriscans. Um, I know certain centers use different values, but um, Feriscan is the gold standard. And if you've got a liver iron of less than seven, you haven't got significant iron that puts the patient at risk of fibrosis. So that's the sort of, um, sort of rationale for the number, you know, that value of seven. Above seven and less than 15, you have got some iron in your liver and you've got an increased risk of fibrosis. Therefore, you need to be aware and monitor these patients and try and improve um, adherence to chelation. And when it's above 15, you start to worry about risk of extra hepatic iron, including cardiac iron. So these are sort of reference values. And this is what really, when you're doing the monitoring and looking at your patients, should be running through your mind. Any questions so far? No? OK, so let's look at the guidelines. So um, so this is what's published quite recently and um, the monitoring aspects of it. You can see there's three things really. They talk serum ferritin, MRI cardiac T2 and your very scan or liver T2 star. It gives you a whole perspective of how well is the patient um, iron loaded or iron neutral. So we do the ferritin one to three monthly when they come for transfusion. Now, what about your cardiac T2 star? Um, for children, the recommendation is by the age of eight. Now, why eight? And I think when we discussed about it, it was really the age when they can have a scan without sedation. If you're worried about your patient, a patient who's got a ferritin of um, eight, you know, 4,000 and he's six years old, you may need to just make a clinical judgment and you might need to do a, a scan with sedation, but that's a clinical judgment depending on an individual case. But for majority of the patients by the age of eight, you'd hope they would have had a baseline scan to look at their iron uh, distribution to give you a, an idea where you stand with each of your patients. The gu guidelines say if it's more than 20 milliseconds with no iron, two yearly scans. Annually, if it's 10 to 20, and six monthly if it's less than 10. Um, for your liver, if you have got a liver iron of less than seven, two yearly scans are acceptable. Annually, if you've got mild to moderate liver iron and six to 12 monthly above 15. Now, these are just guidelines and recommendations. I can tell you that I've got um, a few patients that I uh, haven't had a scan for about three years only because their ferritin have always been in range. They have been adhering to chelation. There was no change in their transfusion. And I know these patients uh, really well. So these are guidelines and what you do. But for individual patients, sometimes you can make a clinical judgment. So from endocrine and bone monitoring, I think these the, the highlights here is the pubertal status. It's really important to assess if they're going through puberty every year from the age of 10. It's important to do an annual OGTT um, only because if you're picking up an impaired glucose test result, you need to determine is it an iron overload issue or have they got a family history of diabetes and it might be um, um, uh, not related to your or to your iron overload. But it's that sort of a review. You'll only know if you do the test and you're monitoring the patients. And in some patients, if you intensify your chelation early enough, you can stop them from becoming diabetics. Um, moving on then to your liver test. Um, 
you do your LFTs every month, you do your virology every year. And for patients who've got clinical liver cirrhosis, the recommendation is for six monthly ultrasound and alpha feta protein um, and a liver team review as well. Some of the other tests, uh, the transfusional iron loading rate, I think um, they've put it um, as 1C grading, but I think this is really quite useful for clinicians to get a feel of using them, and we'll come to that in the next stage. Soluble transferrin receptor, I don't know how many of you have that access to it, but if you can get hold of it, it really helps in terms of determining about extramedullary hematopoiesis, as well as risk of extrahepatic iron loading. It's not easily available, at least um, in Manchester side, uh, but it's a useful test uh, that can be used. Um, so delayed puberty here in the guidelines if is girls who do not go through changes by the age of 13 and boys by the age of 14. Um, from a cardiac perspective, who are those that um, you would call as a good chelator and what cardiology recommendations are we talking about here? Uh, two yearly reviews, if you've got, you're a good chelator uh, with an ECG, echo, and an MRI uh, scan as we outline. But for those who you're worried, who may be developing an iron, three to six monthly cardiology review with ECG and a regular echo of six monthly, looking for subtle diastolic changes. By the time you see left ventricular ejection fraction, a fall in your ejection fraction, it's quite a late event um, for these patients. So moving on then, um, practicalities for monitoring of iron overload and adjusting your chelation. I, I think this is something that really is quite a useful calculation that um, if clinicians can get a feel for it and uh, start using them, it gives you a confidence that you're actually prescribing the right dose of chelation um, and, and you're doing the right thing. So how do you calculate? I call it the royal. Uh, rate of iron loading, short form or short version of it. The number of units over a year, it can be a year, six months, three months, you, you can do it however you want, but say that the, the guidelines we talk about a year, you multiply by 200. Why 200? Because each bag of red cell has got 200 milligrams of iron and you divide that by weight and the number of days to get um, per day um, value. So patients with average transfusion rates, and this is really when you calculate and you find that the rates are 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, requires an average dose of iron chelation. So this is, the, this is really the crucial bit for, for most of us uh, here. When you're prescribing, you want to know, are you prescribing the, the correct dose based on the transfusion rates? For those who have rates below 0 0.3 or above 0 0.5, you may need to prescribe less or more or do a combination but it really gives you a feel. I can't see patients these days without knowing what their royal is before I can adjust the collation. And I know patients based on the royal that this rate and this amount will be fine. And some patients, like I said, haven't had a um, very scan for about three years only because they've been absolutely on a steady state. So what does the guidelines recommend? For stable control of iron, you need to know how much of iron is coming through your transfusion to match the iron that's being removed by your chelation. The starting dose of uh, any of these should be guided by your rate of iron loading. A dose of 50 to 60 milligram five days a week or a deferocerox at 21 milligram will achieve a negative balance for most patients with an average rate of iron loading. So this is this is the sort of uh, dosing you, you, you're looking at. We know for children, we will not exceed a mean daily dose of 40 milligram per kilogram per day. Um, and for adults, we generally, um, they will tolerate 50 milligram per kilogram per dose. Uh, you try uh, on a routine basis, you wouldn't go above that unless you're really leaving them on an intensive chelation due to cardiac iron, you know, you go up to 60. So, They've also gone on to say that 40 milligram per kilogram for five days have been used, but they may not be sufficient to get the patient to a negative iron balance. So I'm going to go with a case and just to discuss and see what everyone thinks. So I've got an ST7 hematology registrar in the clinic. Your consultant is away and you're about to review a patient, a 27 year old transfusion dependent thalassemia in your clinic. 
Your nurse specialist has flagged up the ferritin continues to rise over six months despite being on a good dose of XJ. What do you do? Anybody wants to give a go? You can just speak up. I cannot see anyone, so unless you speak, I'm not going to know. I think it's important to make sure that the patient is actually taking the medication because that's probably usually is poor compliance. So absolutely. Yes, you, you're absolutely right. So that's probably the most likely cause. But as a clinician who's seeing the patient, you want to know that you've actually prescribed the right dose and you've not underculating the patient. And that's why the ferritin is rising. Um, so this patient is on three units every four weeks. The pre-transfusion hemoglobin has always been maintained above 95. That's the sort of magic number to suppress the bone marrow. The liver iron turns out to be 25. There's no cardiac iron. And the patient is actually on a dose of 21 milligram per kilogram for at least the last three months. That's the dose that's been prescribed. Weight is 77. What do you do next? Well, you calculate the rate of iron loading. So let's go and see what the rate comes up. So there's 52 weeks in a year and you divide that by four because they're coming back every four weeks. And each time they come back, they're having three units and it's 200 milligram each bag divided by the weight and divided by the day. Now, if you're doing it over six months, that is um, over over 52, you know, divided by two. You can do it at over three months, six months or a year. But as a trend, I, I just, just do it over a year. Now, some people will say, well, they might get two units or three units. You can calculate for both to get a feel. What are they falling in between? But as an average, you can count to get a feel what the rate comes out. Turns out that this patient actually has a rate of 0 0.27. So he's actually a very relatively a low iron loader, but he's managed to load his iron um, in his liver to 25 milligram per kilogram, despite being on an average dose of XJ. Immediately, I know that this patient is definitely not been taking the iron chelation consistently for whatever reason, but I've prescribed a, a decent dose of iron chelation well above what I would normally do. You then have that discussion with the patient to find out what the problem is, what are they having some side effect, are they having some diarrhea, or they're just messing around. But you, it gives me that confidence even before I see the patient that actually it's a good dose, they should be taking on it. If they're taking it every day, they should be able to get the levels down. Now, if your patient starts taking it all correctly, You'll also find because they are a low iron uh, loader, they're going to de-iron very, very quickly over nine months or a year compared to somebody who has got a rate of iron loading of 0 0.5. Um, so you then need to be quite careful once the ferritin starts falling to start cut, reducing your dose of XJ. So this is where your rate of iron loading really gives you a bit of confidence in terms of monitoring and adjusting your chelation. So this is just a quick slide showing you the three different iron chelators that's available. And um, what do you do then? So optimizing for each of these patients when you see them based on your rate of iron loading. I think this is really the key that comes up from the guidelines with the monitoring and everything else for the clinicians. Aim for a dose of 14 to 28 milligram of Depharacirox for those who are in average to higher uh, rate of iron loading, that's 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, and less intense for those who have a much lower transfusion rate. You manage their side effects. Usually there's a reason why they're not able to take it. Take it with food, crush it, start with a lower dose and build tolerability. Now, I'll, I'll say this, um, the guidelines or SPC say start with 14 milligram per kilogram um, and say if your patient is due to be on a dose of 720 milligram of XJ, which is the 14 milligram dose, I tend to always nearly always start them with the 360 one tablet and then to go up to two after two weeks because it really then overcomes the GI side effect. Once they start developing side effect, they really become reluctant sometimes to take these tablets and they don't always tell you. So when you start low to get to that 14 milligram per kilogram in two weeks, you want to keep them on that dose for three months 
it's definitely worth going on a lower dose and escalating slowly to the dose you want them to be on. Try lactase for those who are lactose intolerant. And if they're getting abdominal pain, uh, look uh, either reduce the dose if the ferritin is falling fairly quickly, that's usually sufficient, or look for H. pylori or um, uh, endoscopy if they've got any other side effect. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, many people are now seeing or bringing up issues about GI side effect with X jade. You see it a lot more when the ferritin starts falling below 700 or 900, or there's a rapid fall in ferritin. Um, so really think about uh, GI side effects for your patients and drop the dose down if they are relatively a lower rate of iron loader. Drop again, adjust the dose if your ferritin is falling rapidly. Um, just so they don't get any renal Fanconi, which we do see quite a bit in some of our patients. Um, with deranged LFTs, you don't really need to do very much as long as they're on the lower dose. Wait for them to recover from the illness and just sit tight. I don't usually adjust the dose if the LFTs are within three times the upper limit of normal. What about deferiprone? And if you're optimizing uh, your patient on deferiprone, you aim to be, leave them on a 75 milligram per kilogram per day or a higher dose, uh, depending on their iron loading. Uh, it's usually given in three divided doses, very short half-life. And um, if you've got patients like my patients who say they absolutely take all the doses, but they take them all at one go in the morning, then you've got the remaining uh, 16 hours with no iron chelation because um, the half-life of deferiprone is just about two to three hours. So it needs to be taken three times a day for it to be effective as a monotherapy. If they've got low iron burden, you can drop it down to 50 milligram per kilogram per day and just keep an eye uh, through your monitoring. Again, it's the education around the side effect. Um, the only time I've not had, I would not use, or the recommendations you wouldn't really use deferiprone if the patient has developed a granulocytosis. It's an absolute contraindication to re-challenge them. Again, you do need to kind of decide if your neutropenia is due to the medication or due to another reason. So I have got patients who've got hypersplenism and mild pancytopenia who run a neutrophil count of 1.3, uh, 1.2, who I have put on deferiprone. Um, so long as that is maintained, I just continue with that. But if they do get a neutrophil pound, a, a severe neutropenia, then you'd be a bit more reluctant to reintroduce that again. So I'm going to skip that. Um, what about minimizing desferol and toxicity? You really try and avoid doses above 40 milligram per kilogram as a mean daily dose for children. Above 50 milligram per kilogram as a mean daily dose in routine use, though in those with myocardial iron, you would go up to 60 uh, with close monitoring. Avoid starting too early. And I think one of the things that are quite useful to remember is when you're reducing the dose because the ferritin is falling, try and reduce the dose rather than the frequency. So if they're on three milligrams uh, five days a week, drop it down to 2.5 or 2 but keep the number of days because there's only um it's the frequency of chelation rather than intensity of it um and the more they're exposed to it the more iron that um comes out and keep within the therapeutic index and you have to monitor for toxicity so before i move to the next uh which is going to be a case i'm just going to take a pause i can't see anybody but if anybody has anything to ask or questions to ask on uh, on that monitoring Andy, it's no amy here i've got two quick questions the first mm. is you know you were saying um you're looking at the ejection fraction on the t2 star mri mm. do you not bother to do echoes if you're if someone's having t2 star mri because i'm never sure whether what you're getting on the ejection fraction is fine, or if they also need an echo. So the the um, so my cardiologists here, they are quite. We we get we can get CMR or cardiac MRI very very readily. Um, we tend to do cardiac MRI, but if you're looking at diastolic dysfunction or looking for pulmonary hypertension, um, depending on how comfortable your cardiologist, some of them prefer to do an echo. 
our cardiology just prefers to do a CMR. So we rarely request echo as a routine uh, test um, unless it's been discussed with a cardiologist through our MDTs. OK, thank you. I'll check with my cardiologist then. And my second question, um, I this is just for anybody and maybe I'm hijacking this meeting, but that's well, I've got a patient who takes that's and gets chest tightness with her infusions. Mm stops when she stops the infusion and I've not heard of that before is that something you've seen and is that something I should be concerned about I've definitely not seen that I don't know if anyone else has seen that maybe you can take the other questions and people can say something in the chat and I can contact them if they've seen that thank you okay so is this is a case of um a, a patient that presented sorry, Nancy, recently a couple hands up that you probably oh can't. sorry I can't see um, sorry yes there's uh, Alu who was first Hi, thank you for this wonderful presentation. One of the questions is, who will be having this slide? And secondly, I'm a pediatrician, and I do have some patients, sickle cell patients and thalassemia patients that are on um, uh, Desperazi rocks. And they, a lot, I've got three or four patients that really react to exchange, either with the, um, the uh, gut uh, com complications with gastritis, which obviously you have mentioned there how to deal with them and yet usually that kind of gets better but it's the lfts that uh usually uh, they get above uh three four times and then we have to stop it and then it comes down and then we gradually restart it again and then it goes up and some of them we use the ferroprodon as well and their iron just doesn't go down i think it's because it's three times a day and obviously the second dose is difficult to give in yeah. school so you yeah. really have lots of problems with those particular patients. So there's one that probably has to have um, IV desperate rocks because of the, all the complications that we're having. I, I think it's really important to, uh, like you said, I think looking at the age of the, the, the patient, what they can tolerate, what they can manage, working out a, a, a chelation regimen that they can manage. Um, I tend to drop down the dose to a level where they don't have side effects. I've got so I've got patients who are on deferiprone. As soon as I put them up to uh, 50 milligram per kilogram, they get severe heel pain or joint arthropathies. And as soon as I drop it down, if they are on a thousand milligram dose, I put it down to a dose below 500. They can manage it, but they cannot go beyond that dose. So that is the limit of the dose where they get side effect or toxicity. And they're not on the maximum dose of what is recommended, but it's limiting because of toxicity. But I tend to leave them on the minimal tolerated dose, and you might need to add something else um, on top of that if they are becoming iron loaded. Um, so it, it really, it's an individual regimen based on the side effect. If they're getting the GI side effect, I drop it down and leave them on a lower dose for a good few weeks because most of them will overcome it. But if they still have, despite crushing it with yogurt, having it with food, um, you know, with trial, with le lactase, you've done everything you can, then I think you need to think of another option for the time being. Um, and it's really what works for the patient because if they're having side effect and you have to take a medication every day, I can tell you I will not be taking it. And now I won't even LFTs as well for X LFTs. So it's it's usually up to three times the upper limit of normal. We do not need to intervene or change the dose. You can continue with that. It's only once it starts going well above three times the upper limit of normal. I'm not a pediatrician. Um, we will be doing a session with uh, one of the pediatric hematologists doing one sometime in March next month. You can take that with them with the pediatric aspect. Um, but in the adult side or the young people, if it's a stable LFT, three times the ALT is th less than three times the upper limit of normal, we just sit tight. It does tend to improve for some of the patients over time. If not, you can drop it down uh, when it goes higher and leave them on a slightly lower dose. I've had patients who've had a bilirubin of 160 on a, a higher dose of x -Jade, completely normalized once I've dropped it just slightly below the, the, the level. And once the levels come back down, you can then um, re-challenge them again. In so I'm going to move on to this case. Noemi, I'm telling you, you'll know this patient because it's a mutual patient of ours. Um, but um, I'll um, I'll I'll talk through this case. So she's a 26-year-old. She's a law student, transmission dependent. She's a CDA diagnosis. 
She's had recurrent UTIs in the past. She's got a big spleen. She's got a bit of pancytopenia and large liver. Her last MRI iron assessment in August showed a T2 star of 11 milliseconds and an ejection fraction of 61%. Um, her liver iron concentration was 39. On admission, her iron chelation was just a ferriprone at a dose of 45 milligram per kilogram. This was mainly because her neutropenia on a higher dose and as she would not tolerate it. She was also put on some XJ uh, in the interim while we were waiting um, for another line to go in. Prior to that, she's been on a port with um, IV Desperal. However, she's had a port infection and that port had come out. Her pick line, um, missed, she missed the appointment and she just would not do subcut. So she was on what she could tolerate the best until another line went in. And she presented with three days of shortness of breath and she'll tell you what brought her in to hospital. She just could not get out of bed because she was feeling really short of breath to go to the toilet. Um, and that's what brought her into the hospital. She had uh, been prescribed with nitrofurantoin for her UTI four to five days before that. And uh, uh, when she came into ED, all hell broke loose because there was a lot of panic going on. Her systolic blood pressure was in the 80s um, and she had a fever. Her sats were 100%, her resp, she was not tachypneic, she was really comfortable from a chest point of view. She was really, really tachycardic um, at 160 uh, or even a bit higher. Her haemoglobin was 60, this is not unusual. She's had lower haemoglobins and she's never had this type of a shortness of breath. Her JVP was normal, no pedal edema, edema, ECG was sinus techy, chest was clear. So I think what is your differential at this point? Um, is she a septic shock with a UTI and pyelonephritis because she's got a uh, blood pressure of 80s and she's tachycardic? Or she's got all of that, but also clinical heart failure based on her clinical history of significant iron, poor chelation history, and presenting with shortness of breath on very minimal exertion. If you can see the S symbol, the Slido symbol, then you should be able to answer the question. I think oh, one person has voted. But if not, then just <laughs> it leave just it in one? the comments. Okay. No, we can't see it. B, B. It would say B2, okay. I think if you can answer, if you can just put something in the chat box, I'd really, really appreciate it. Okay, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I'm very pleased everyone's passed the exams. This is it. So it, it, it is, I think you need to think about the differential, treat the sepsis, but you need to think that this patient is high risk of developing heart failure and they have a rapid risk of decompensation and therefore they've not had any meaningful collation. You need to intervene and there's a bit of urgency here. So this is a clinical presentation. The slides are not in the right order. But what turns out, she had a CRP of 233, HB is about 60. She's met acute metabolic uh, acidosis with a bicarb of 13, and she's got AKI um, with, with a slightly reduced renal function. She had seven and a half litre fluid resuscitation. She only weighs about 35 kilogram, and um, the blood pressure did not budge. And um, the cardiologist who found out about this was a bit horrified that she had this much of fluid. IT reviewed her and decided she would not need inotropic support. Her ECG had sinus tachycardia. Her BNP came back at 7,000. Bedside echo revealed at that point with a pulse rate of 160. Echo was showing an ejection fraction of 58%. A departmental echo later on showed and confirmed an ejection fraction of 40%. This was almost about 36 hours after starting her chelation. She was started on IV tazazine. She grew Klebsiella from her blood cultures and she responded really well to IV taz. Um, her desferol was initially put on a slightly higher dose but was reduced to a lower dose because of the AKI. And uh, she was seen by the heart failure team and started on bisoprolol and ACE inhibitor. So this is what happened to her. And I think this was a chart that I really wanted to show you to kind of highlight. So you can uh, you can appreciate her resp, resp is completely normal. She's with somebody who can't get out of bed to go to the toilet. Her resp is incredibly normal. She's saturating at 
Now, what is really quite interesting is this blood pressure sitting at 80. Now, by the time this picture was taken, she was already two days into the, you know, nearly 24 hours into her desferal. And you can see nothing really changed. Less than 24 hours initiating the IV desferoxamine, her blood pressure has improved, her pulse rate improved. Her heart failure medication only really started, uh, you know, um, uh, on the 7th, um, uh, a bit later on, and a pulse rate just came, uh, just improved as well. So, they, 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 you know, this is really the sort of picture. As a hematologist who's treating and looking after this patient, you probably know a lot more than the ED physicians, intensivists, unless they are familiar with treating patients with iron in the heart. You have to go that extra mile to kind of, you know, make people aware that sometimes it's the iron in the heart does do all of this and it's not just septic shock and you need to try and get in there to get the IV desferoxamine in early. Some of the things and some of the issues that have come through this is really you need to suspect if you think about it, start the desferoxamine in ASAP. Do not wait for a bedside echo, a BNP to confirm. These can take up to 24 hours and this is time critical. Um, some of the things that cardiologists have flagged up is echo can be really difficult to interpret in a patient who's really tachycardic. You can't pick up some of the subtle diastolic dysfunction and it can falsely reassure the clinician. And when you're working on a weekend out of hours when you haven't got everybody on site, you really want to just get started with the desferoxamine. Some of the res reservation or concerns people had was sepsis and could the iron chelator drive the sepsis? I think at this point, you're going to save her if you're worried about heart failure. Start the desferoxamine. You can always review it after 24, 36 hours, depending on what happens to the CRP and her fever. You do need a, a cardiologist with an expertise to look at iron in the heart to interpret that echo. Um, it's really difficult. It can be easily overlooked by the ED physicians, even cardiology registrars. I'd pick up the phone and find your friendly cardiologist or your cardiologist or the on-call and explain the situation and get them to have a look at the images because the reports can vary quite considerably depending on who looks at it. Out of our, the other thing to flag up is your on-call pharmacist. If you haven't got, like my patients who do not bring Desferol even though they have it at home, you need to bleep your pharmacist on call and say, I need this Desferol up and running now. And it, the responsibility really lies with the hematology team to ensure you've prescribed it and it's actually given in a timely manner. I'd send your nurse specialist or registrar or ring the ED to make sure this is up and running. So in her case, her echo reviewed by the cardiologist came back at 40%. The initial echo back in August was 61. Her repeat after about a week um, has now gone back to normal. And the, the impressive symptom that the patient will tell you, her shortness of breath actually improved within 24 hours of starting the desferoxamine. And that was a remarkable clinical improvement. She felt she could go home um, after starting the desferoxamine. So what do hematologists need to know when you have patients with suspected heart failure? I say this only because I don't think anyone should be put in this position. We shouldn't really be seeing patients uh, and having to treat heart failure. If they have come to this level, every level of care has failed. Everything has failed. You must do the right thing and save the patient by starting the IV desferoxamine. It really saves their life. So in even in the most acute, severe decompensated, when I say decompensated is if you've got a lot of iron in the heart, your heart is pretty stiff. And as soon as you get an infection and you're unwell, your heart can't cope. I have very little cardiology knowledge, by the way, is what I've been told by my cardiologist. Your heart can't cope. And what happens is when you get an infection, you tip that balance and you rapidly drop your ejection fraction. You can drop from 60 to 30. And if you're decompensated, you get ankle swelling, your JVP is raised. If you're uncompensated, like what happened in this girl, your ejection fraction falls, but you're uncompensated, you have shortness of breath, but you may not have some of the other failure symptoms. And this is the difference with heart failure in thalassemia compared to your other patients. And this is the knowledge you need to be aware because when you're discussing with your ED physicians, they may not know this and you need to highlight this. The desferoxamine really stabilizes the heart and reverses the ejection fraction. 
uh, with your continuous chelation, it's that continuous chelation that is really needed. You want to maintain good electrolyte levels. These patients, you need to be really careful putting them on inotropic support. They do really well with a much lower central systemic blood pressure than in your non-thalassemic heart failure patients. And like most patients, they, they tend to run a low blood pressure. They tend to have a bit of tachycardia. You should really be having a continuous cardiac monitor only because VT is something can, that can be picked up. And it's quite a unique feature in patients that are, have got myocardial iron. The first 24, 48 hours of these patients, when they come in, it's really critical that we do things right and get it right because it really changes and you can save their life. Avoid aggressive resuscitation as in a fluid or transfusion will increase their preload and push them into pulmonary edema. And this is something cardiologists don't like. This is what all the things that I've learned from this, uh, this patient. There were a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. And if you don't see this and they present out of hours, having that knowledge and knowing about this is really, really important. I will also reflect on the two previous cases of myocardial iron. I will say I've been a consultant for just over four years doing red cells, but I've treated four patients so far, not directly with these two, but have had involvement. Uh, two patients survived. These two patients died and it was in 2017, 2018. They had severe complications from myocardial iron. They both had a history of poor compliance to chelation, significant iron overload, both presented with shortness of breath in exactly the similar manner. They just couldn't walk uh, flat ground to any short distances. They were hypotensive and tachycardic. These are the hallmarks. You do not always get the similar features in some of the other failure type of symptoms, but these seem to be the repeated same type of history and symptoms that the patient present. They may have a low blood pressure, but they always will tell you they're short of breath and they can't walk, and that's what brings them in. Um, the patients who died had some delay in recognizing the rapid de decompensation and that, that that early initiation of intensive continuous IV chelation did not come in early enough. So treat sepsis, but please start IV chelation ASAP. Do not wait for anything to confirm. You are the clinician. You know these patients best. You've got to do the right thing at that moment in time. So again, this is a slide to highlight Think of this differential if they present of shortness of breath, ankles plus minus ankle swelling or raised JVP. Tachycardia that does not improve with a bit of fluid um, and hypertension that does not go away. History of myocardial iron, poor chelation history. And I say if they've come to this level and you're thinking of heart failure, these patients have failed every other level of care. You just have to intervene. So moving on from there, I think this is something that's really worth looking at. Um, John Porter and Bernard Davies in UCLH had done this study uh, back in the 80s and 2000. If you think about it, the cardiac two MRIs only really came to clinical practice when uh, the validation for them or um, they were a validated tool for myocardial iron monitoring in the 2000. Up until then, in the late 90s, patients were presenting with heart failure. You cannot tell based on your ferritin or your liver iron that this patient has got iron in the heart. You really got to do the echo and look for the ejection fraction. So the, the T2 stars have really made things a bit easier because you can actually measure the amount of iron they have and quantitate the risk of developing heart failure and intensify their treatment before they reach to a level where you need to give them rescue therapy with IV um, intensive um, desferioxamine. So they did a study and what they were trying to intervene is if patients had a 10% fall in the ejection fraction or uh, ejection fraction outside the reference range, you intensify with IV or subcut. And um, what they did do is they found that patients who had an ejection fraction of less than 45% or uh, a fall of more than 10% had a 25% risk or 25 times increased risk of cardiac disease cardiac death and a median time of three and a half years between a fall in your ejection fraction to developing cardiac failure. And out of the 34 patients that required intensification, 17 had subcutaneous desferoxamine, 17 had IV, all 27 who had intensified lived, but the seven who failed to comply died. And I think this is a really powerful study in highlighting and appreciating as a clinician, 
when you're seeing these patients in your clinic, it's quite important to keep this in your mind. Um, so moving on to that, I don't know time wise. I've got another eight minutes. OK, I'm not going to go through all of this. This is actually in the BCSH guidelines, and it really breaks down in terms of what do you do when you have a patient with a low T2 star with normal ejection fraction and low ejection fraction. I think the key here is once you start seeing myocardial iron loading, you need to definitely consider intensifying your treatment. Think about adding combination. Whatever regimen you choose to do based on the guidelines is you really need to see what your patients will comply with, what's the age of the patient, where they are at this point in life, are they willing to comply? Birmingham and myself have got one patient with a T2 star of 7.5 who has got liver iron of 16. She absolutely will not go to IV dust for examine. And she's just on oral combination. She's a ticking time box, um, time bomb, I sorry. But we are aware about her. Everybody knows what to do if she comes in with heart failure symptoms. We try at every clinic, and I think we've been in touch to try and see if she's changed her mind. So you cannot make a patient take IV desferol if they don't do it, but you really need to intervene when they present with heart failure. That's your one time to get in there and get it right. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to do this, but I'll share the slides. Um, so if they've got a T2 star of less than eight milliseconds, most of the time, um, uh, they, if they've got a normal ejection fraction, the first line you have to remember is still IV desferol. IV desferioxamine and deferiprone is cardioprotective. What exactly you do with the regimen in the combination you decide, but this is the choice you'd want to offer your patient. This is the first line. And if they present with heart failure symptoms, you start with the IV desferioxamine. Now, the dose recommended is 50 to 60, but like in this patient who had AKI, um, I had to drop the dose a little bit only because if she carried on on the higher dose, her AKI may have worsened. She improved on a slightly lower dose. The aim is really having some desferol running through these patients continuously rather than um, not being able to deliver. So, um, so that's the recommended dose. So looking at this, these are values. These are Dr. Farooq Shah's values and um, where she got them from, you'll have to ask her. But what is the risk of developing heart failure uh, by your T2 star values? Um, so if you've got a T2 star 10 to 20 milliseconds, you've got a higher risk of developing a reduced LV systolic function than patients who have got a normal T2 star, a very small risk of heart failure. But that risk increases. If you've got eight to 10 milliseconds, that risk is 12% over the next year. Six to eight milliseconds is 30%, and less than six milliseconds is 50%. Now, as much as these values are values, but if you get a low ejection fraction, you need to intervene and you have to act on that ejection fraction report. So I'll conclude my session by saying, I think effective monitoring is the key. Um, to pick up early warning indicators of iron overload, you want to act on them before your organ dysfunction develops. And these are your clinical nurse specialists. They are your backbones with the monitoring. Um, you can't survive without them. As a clinician, I cannot survive without them. We've got some really complex patients on several different combinations. They keep an eye, they flag up. They are really the engine behind the monitoring for these patients. Um, Calculating and adjusting your dose using your rate of iron loading really gives clinicians the confidence they are definitely prescribing the right dose. Whether the patient takes it or not, takes it or not is another uh, discussion and, and, and things, but you need to make sure you're prescribing the right dose. All collators work so long as you're taking them in the right dose and in the right frequency. If you think about heart failure, please start the treatment. Don't wait for diagnostics to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, the, the, you know, the heart failure. And I always say shortness of breath, hypotension and tachycardia. These are hallmark features of heart failure. You can easily be um, uh, diverted with septic shock. But think about this as a clinician who know these patients most. Think about heart failure and start the IV desferol early. And not every patient who has a fall in ejection fraction has a decompensated heart failure they may well have uncompensated heart failure with just a fall in ejection fraction. This is really the difference between thalassemia and non-thalassemia heart failure. But in either way, 
if you start intensification, a lot of the problems are resolved um, for them. I'll stop there and thank you for listening. I will close this because I cannot see anybody there. OK. We've got a bit of time for a bit of question, answer, a discussion. It really is should be an informal discussion just to kind of, um, you know, so please feel free to ask questions. If I can answer them, I'll answer them. I've got Joanna from Frimley. Hi, um, I I'm a paediatrician, so um, it's just really, it was really interesting um, listening to your session. Thanks so much. But I suppose what really interested me about that case that you showed where you gave the IV Desferal and you showed the OBS chart and the inference that, you know, giving the IV Desferal reverses the um, hemodynamic instability that you're seeing there. And you've got that young person you then described that you're sharing with Birmingham who's refusing to have any IV collation. So when is there any value then in patients like this in giving them some IV desferro when they come up for their transfusions because they'll have to come for their transfusions anyway and is there any rationale because I mean it's just really striking to me that you gave some IV desferro to somebody who's got significant cardiac dysfunction and their cardiac dysfunction reversed so promptly yet we all know any of us who look after patients for chronic eye inclination that things don't reverse that promptly when you're looking after them chronically um, and I know a lot of that's adherence but is there any other way that you can use IV treatment for young adults who really don't want to have it all the time? Or is it just the fact that giving it every now and again is no good? You need to give it all the time. Sorry, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I, I think I think there are certain units that use triple chelation uh, as a mode of chelating. Um, I think it's how easy is it to prepare this IV desferol and get it up and running when they come for the transfusion. It takes time. It's not quick. It's not easy. Most of the desferoxamines are home care delivery these days. So pharmacy on site just does not prepare. I cannot tell you the number of times my patients who've been admitted who just don't bring the IV preparations and it's a bit of a hassle. Right. On a day unit, I think it's quite hard. You probably you could you could use it. I think for this girl, it's probably an option. But there's if if the team um, might need to prescribe it, get it all up and re ready before she comes, it would be an option. In mm -hmm. this girl, her ejection fraction is quite preserved. She's just got a low T to start at the moment, but she's mm -hmm. really high risk. She can have a rapid decompensation as soon as in the tip. She she will tip the balance when she gets an infection. Um, and that that is something she recognizes, she understands, but she's 17. She's in university. She just yeah, wouldn't yeah. want a line in there. She wants to go out and enjoy. So it's really hard and uh, it's 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 a really difficult situation. You just hope sense will kick in for them mm -hmm. and you just have to keep trying and seeing if they've changed their mind. OK, thank you. So interesting. Thank you. Um, I've got somebody else who put their hand. I can't see. Um, who's that? Who've got their hands raised there? Um, Thomas. 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 Hello, Thomas. I can't. Hello, see. sorry, I just couldn't unmute. Hi, thank you for that. Very, very interesting. And um, I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate a bit on how you reduce ionculation. Um, and what what prompts you to and how do you decide how much to reduce by when you're when somebody's been well collated and their ferritins are coming down? So um it depends on what ion collation they're on. So for example, um if their rate of ion loading is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 and the ferritin is falling quite nicely to 300 and 500, uh, you know, well below 300 from well over 2000. They've been on a dose of 28 milligram per kilogram. I think you might drop it down to 21 milligram per kilogram. There's no right or wrong. It's a bit like cooking in salt, uh, adding the salt in it. But the the rates and the average doses will give you a feel in terms of um, how you reduce. So I tend to just drop it by one tablet. If they're on five, three, sixties, drop it down to one or bring it down to the 180. I don't have an easy answer. I think it's a feel you get based on your rate of iron loading, the transfusion regimen, and you, 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 I usually just drop it down by seven milligrams, three and a half to seven milligrams on the X-shaped dose. 
um, with the death for examen, I try not to reduce the frequency. So if, if they've been doing five days a week, I tend to reduce the dose to fall within therapeutic index, but to try and keep them in five days rather than dropping it down to three days where I can. I don't know if I make a bit of sense there. Yeah. And if there are sickle cell patients, perhaps who aren't there for getting regular transfusions, perhaps perhaps they have now on hydroxycarbamide and you you ah, might need to deal with the ferritin. Yes. Um, yes. So they aren't people who are getting this regular kick of iron. At some point, you might reach a point where you want to stop. Would you normally stop below a hundred, below a thousand ferritin, or would you keep on a low dose and aim for a lower mm. ferritin than that? So with the sickle cell patients, you if you if if they are on iron chelation, I would get a ferris scan. If your liver iron is less than five, you just stop all iron chelation, because your sickle cell patients do not iron load if they are uh, not on transfusion. If they've had previous transfusion and they've load they've got iron loading, then. Uh, for a period, you, you just can collate them uh, with some exjate or desferoxamine, mean, depending on what your patient prefers. But you need to monitor it with a ferry scan. The ferritin may not always be accurate in sickle cell disease because it's a pro-inflammatory uh, disorder. I find that the ferry scans are, or MRI, uh, liver iron concentration imaging, are more accurate. As soon as it drops below five, I just stop it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Right. Any other questions anyone has or anybody to share anything you think that's been, you know, that from your practice or um, anything you want to share? Yes, I can't see who is it, but I can see a hand raised. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to ask um, when you're starting a patient who um, just has high ferritins, um, are there particular things you take into account as your choice of first choice uh, collation or do you go off a bit more what the patient wants or what what do you do really for iron for, so if you're initiating an iron collator for um because they've got a high uh, iron loading um my first choice tends to be for adults is xj but if the some patients just can't take that tablet, they just don't like tablets. So I've got one patient who absolutely says, I will do no tablets, doctor. But he beautifully collates on uh, subcut desferoxamine three times a week and his iron is coming down quite nicely. So it's um, very much what patients prefer. I prefer to do XJ to deferiprone only because you only have to take it once a day. Deferiprone is three times a day. It's really difficult for my young people to do three times a day. Um, so first choice is x -jade. If they can't, then it's desferoxamine and then it's deferiprone. Again, I, I think it really depends on what their previous chelation history is like. If if they already have um, you know, issues with tablet, they can't swallow, they've got nausea, they develop some of the arthropathies, you really need to tailor it to what suits them. You need to trial it. And some of the, the things I've said on the slides, which I'm willing to share, you need to just go through with the patient and work out. Um, and you really need to prompt some of them. I've got patients who just absolutely will do what they want to do, but will not volunteer that they are having diarrhea every time they take the three tablets of XJ. And they're absolutely fine with the two tablets of XJ. Um, they don't always volunteer this information and you will be happily prescribing, you know, three 360s thinking that's the dose they're on. But they're only managing two tablets, but and that's where that that discussion uh, really helps. And sometimes I have to not be able to inc I don't increase if they've got toxicity, but consider adding an, a second agent um, to um, try and get that iron level down. Um, there's no easy answer. And I have to say that over the years, it's you know, having seen and treated a lot more of these patients and having quite a few on combination, it's given me a bit more confidence um, with the uh, chelation. The guidelines there that's come through is incredibly helpful um, for clinicians who don't have a very many patients on iron chelation. I think that the guidelines is really helpful. And um, I'm hoping to do a second session a bit more on iron chelation itself. And there's going to be a pediatric uh, um, session on management and monitoring of iron overload. I think that's going to be next in, in early March. And I think maybe we'll and in, in the second session, I'll do a few more cases to, to highlight some of the issues uh, with some of the patients we've had. If that's something um, I'm quite, quite happy to do that. 
Uh, I've got a hand up from somebody. I can't see. Hi, um, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just was wondering when you're doing your IV collation, um, when you have uh, people on it needing it sort of more long term, mm. do you anticoagulate the lines or not? We're having yes. a debate now about uh -huh. whether we should, shouldn't. So that's a, that's a really good one because I think there's a lot of discussion going on. So all patients, um, all transfusion dependent thalassemias or inherited rare anemia, so my CDA patients, if they all have got a PICC line or a port, I tend to leave them all on some low dose uh, thromboprophylaxis, either rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams, while they've got the line in. The issue I have is some of these patients who are needing IV intensive or, or a, a line in for chelation, most of them tend to have a big spleen and a mild um, thrombocytopenia. And I've got one girl where I can't uh, leave on it because a platelet count does, you know, it always runs around 30 to 50. Um, and she's had some bruising when she goes on it. But generally, it's a yes, uh, only because, you know, the lines are pro thrombotic um, and they can cause problems. We've had a patient not in this current unit where I've worked previously, a non transfusion patient, uh, NTDT patient who had a line in for um, uh, IV chelation. And um, there was some, uh, he had it in a PIC line in for two years and it, it, it got embedded. It, it was really difficult. He had to get vascular team to come in and get, um, get that line out. Uh, so these patients are pro thrombotic. Uh, so if the line is in, I tend to leave them. There's going to be a guidance at the back of it. The four thal HCCs are discussing about this for sickle and thal, but definitely for thalassemia and rare anemias. This is something at the back of our mind. Alice? Sorry, I just wanted to say thank you. That's really helpful. Right, so thank you everyone for joining in for today's session. Um, and I hope you found it useful and informative. Um, and till we meet again in the next session, thank you all. See you.